appreciate it. Thank you. Savannah Craig. Casey, thank, thank you. you so much. And the congressman so eloquent on that point that this is a, a time that underscores yeah. that political differences are one thing, but we need to remember that we were all Americans and uh, our hearts go out to all of those who were injured today. While that conversation was happening, two bits of information came in. We heard from uh, Kevin McCarthy, the Republican majority leader in the House, uh, telling us that Steve Scalise, the Louisiana congressman who was shot this morning, is out of surgery and he is doing well. That again, according to Kevin McCarthy. We also, uh, getting from our investigative team right now, uh, Andrew Blankenstein reporting that the ATF, uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, conducting emergency training is on two separate firearms, one rifle and one handgun. Again, that would jive with what we've heard from a number of folks who are at the baseball field this morning. Right, and Pete Williams of NBC able to confirm the identity of, of the shooter. James Hodgkinson is the identity that law enforcement has given to Pete. And um, we, we want to show again a video, and, and with a word of caution, um, because it shows Congressman Steve Scalise in the moments after he was shot. This comes from our colleagues at CBS, and here is um, Mr. Scalise being carried off in a stretcher. We know he was shot in the hip. We know, according to several witnesses we've spoken to this morning, that he was alert and uh, described to us as being in good spirits and able to speak to his wife from the hospital moments before going into surgery. And as Craig just mentioned, now Kevin McCarthy, who's the Republican leader in the House, has said that Mr. Scalise is out of surgery. The congressman is doing better. And um, of course, we look forward and are anxious to hear from him about what went on today. Professionally, uh, of course, the, the whip is charged with rounding up the votes. Uh, but throughout the course of the morning, we have found out that apparently the congressman, quite the baseball fan yes. as well, played second base, took the job uh, very seriously. And also apparently during the course of his campaigning was known to, to actually hand out bats. Uh, to supporters. Our justice correspondent Pete Williams continuing uh, to work the phones, trying to gather some new information. Uh, Pete, do we, do we have any new information at, at this juncture? We're still trying to figure out, I thought one of the strange things about the news conference was that they didn't tell us precisely how many people were injured and what the extent of their injuries is. Perhaps uh, there were more people uh, shot than we were initially told and that some of their injuries were minor. Uh, that may be why they didn't tell us more, but um, we're still trying to, we, we remarkably still can't tell you with certainty how many people uh, were, were wounded here. So we're still trying to nail that down in, in addition to try to find out more about the, the nature of the uh, suspect. Uh, but as I said a, a little earlier, they, they were apparently on to the identity pretty quickly because the uh, suspect, we're told, had an Illinois driver's license, obviously had a name on it. Um, I think one of the reasons that we normally in a situation like this, we would hear about that pretty quickly, but we didn't because we've had some experience here of shootings in the Washington area where a suspect had an identity card that turned, actually not just in the Washington area, that identity card that turned out not to be his, that was someone else's. Mm. So I think they wanted to do a, a little initial checking on that. But uh, now all the wheels are in motion, tracing the weapon, getting a search warrant to search his residence, uh, getting a search warrant to search his car, and, and trying to trace all these movements. But as I say, we're told that he's a, I guess, 66-year-old, born December of 1950, 66-year-old man from Belleville, Illinois, named James T. Hodgkinson. And as I had said a moment ago, uh, the motive here does not appear to be uh, what we would conventionally think of as a terrorist motive, certainly not an internationally inspired one, whether this is what you might call domestic terrorism or someone with mental problems or that this is a politically inspired thing, someone here who came with a political grudge. Uh, I think we'll have to wait a while to be certain about that. But uh, everyone has said that they don't see any signs of international terrorism. Hey, Pete, we've got a name, we've got an age. Uh, do we know if this, this man had a record at all? Was he known to police? Well, uh, yeah, he, he may be known to the police in Illinois. There's some indication that he had some some run-ins with the police, but uh, nothing, I, if I understand the, the gravamonte of your question, nothing that would indicate any kind of a danger like this. All right, Pete, stand by there as I know you continue to work the phones. Um, a little earlier, T Tennessee Congressman Chuck Fleischman spoke to our Casey Hunt. Let's listen to their conversation. He and I decided to make a run for the dugout. Uh, that's where a lot of our members got hurt, like myself, trying to jump into the dugout to try to find a safe 
place away from the bullets that were being fired. Uh, unfortunately, when we got to the dugout, we realized that we were still under attack. The shots were still coming. The Capitol Police, fortunately, were there because, because of our whip, Steve Scalise. They returned fire. They probably saved our lives and the lives of a lot of other people because we were all sitting ducks, those of us who were in the, the dugout. But when I got in the dugout, I realized that a lot of people were bleeding. Uh, one gentleman was, was shot in the leg. Um, once local law enforcement arrived and subdued the shooter, we were told it was okay to get up, and then we realized the magnitude of the carnage and, and our members who'd been shot, uh, our staff members who'd been severely wounded. Uh, one young gentleman got shot in the chest. It was horrible. He was just in my office yesterday. Was he a staffer for you? Who's, no, who was the young uh, man? Uh, um, his name is Micah. Uh, I just know him by Micah, and uh, he plays with us every day. What happens is a lot of the Hill staffers and folks come out and volunteer uh, for both teams and lend their, their talents, their support, and uh, in preparation for the game. It's an annual event. It's supposed to be a very happy, uplifting thing for both sides. Uh, today was a tragedy. What was it like for you personally? You said you walked right by the shooter? Yeah. Uh, as it turns out, I was walking right past the third base side, said hello to my good friend Trent Kelly from Mississippi, and we were just exchanging niceties about how well we had both played that day. And uh, the reason I know that is when I walked around, that's where the fire, that first shot came from and the barrage of shots came from. I was just lucky that he chose not to shoot me. What, what do you think should happen next now? I mean, Well, obviously, uh, we don't know the motives of the shooter. Uh, innocent people have been shot, have been hurt badly, uh, including members of Congress uh, and their staffs. Um, when we go to a baseball field, we think we are safe. I mean, baseball is a great American institution. We think we are safe. Uh, I've played seven years. I have never, ever feared for my security. Uh, now I fear for my security. Uh, after seeing the carnage there today uh, and the fact that somebody could come up and do that uh, with a rifle, it's, it's shocking, it's sad. Um, and my thoughts and prayers go out to the people who are injured a lot worse than, than I was. And this dirt on your shirt is from hitting the ground? Absolutely. When the shooter came? Absolutely. And what happened to your hand? You um, said I got bloodied up a little bit when I jumped into the dugout. Obviously, uh, Larry Hardy and I and others were down on the field, laying down flat, hoping not to get hit. But we realized, as the bullets kept flying, that if somebody were to see us, we were still uh, easy targets. So we made a run for the dugout, uh, as did several other people. Uh, fortunately, I made it, but it was a scary few minutes in the dugout. I stayed on the inside wall of the dugout, as did other members, uh, many of whom were bleeding. And uh, uh, Do just you have a sense it, of how many other members were wounded or hit? Or just it was it just Steve Scalise that was hit? That's all we've in heard so far. In terms of yes, he was hit. Roger Williams, one of our key coaches, I believe, had a broken ankle. I saw him being taken away by stretcher. Um, uh, Micah, the staffer. Uh, sadly was apparently shot in the chest he was being attended to. They brought in helicopters very quickly. Two of the Capitol Police officers who basically saved our lives uh, were shot. Uh, these folks are heroes. I don't know who they are personally because uh, this is part of Whip Scalise's detail, right. uh, security detail. But for the fact that they were there, the carnage would have been worse. Sir, thank you so much for telling, taking the time to tell you our story. Casey Hunt and Tennessee Congressman Chuck Fleischman a few moments ago, and it's interesting, you know, the details are just coming in. We yeah. haven't had a confirmation officially on the number of injured. So now we hear Congressman Fleischman saying that he knows of a staffer by the name of Micah who was shot in the chest. Right. We thought that there was just one congressional aide that was shot. But we also know that Roger Williams, the congressman, says he has a congressional aide by the name of Zach Parth who was shot. So I, I think the point is we just don't know right. at this point if perhaps there were additional people shot and we're just waiting for the authorities to um, give us the, the answer there. We know two Capitol Police officers were shot. We heard the police chief mm -hmm. say they're in good condition. We know Steve Scalise was shot. He's out of surgery, said to be doing well. And then we've heard of these two other congressional staffers. Um, and we will continue to try to track this down again.
get the best information to you. We know that two are in critical condition at the George Washington University uh, Hospital there in D.C. That's according to the hospital. But what you just said uh, could explain precisely why uh, the field rep from the FBI was so reluctant uh, to talk about precisely how many were shot and how many were wounded. Should also mention the shooter himself. Right. Identified as James Hodgkinson, also shot and uh, unclear what his condition and how serious that is and whether he'll survive, according to Pete Williams. Well, we have heard from a number of lawmakers, Republican and Democrat, here over the last uh, hour or two. We are going to be hearing from House Speaker Paul Ryan uh, at noon and also word from the White House a short time ago that President Trump is going to be uh, addressing the nation at roughly 1130. Peter Alexander is standing by for us uh, at the White House. Peter, at this point, any indication what we might expect to hear from the president? Well, Craig, I expect that he'll punctuate the remarks that he first delivered via a statement this morning saying he was deeply saddened by this tragedy. He referred to the congressman, the ma majority whip Steve Scalise, as a true friend and patriot. We are getting some information from the White House about what the president has been doing over the course of the last several hours. He had a, an event, a speech to the Labor Department scheduled for later today. We know that's been canceled, but he has had an opportunity to be notified about the situation in Alexandria and to speak to many lawmakers this this morning, among those with whom he has spoken, Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, also the wife of Congressman Majority Whip Steve Scalise, as well as the Chief of Staff to Congressman Steve Scalise and the Chief of the Capitol Hill Police. Mike Pence was scheduled to be at an event for the National Association of Home Builders this morning. That was canceled. In fact, in his absence, they held a moment of silence there earlier today. Instead, he was rerouted here to the White House, where he's been huddling with White House aides and the president this morning. The Marine Guard right now is standing out front of the West Wing, which would signify to us that the president right now is inside the Oval Office, presumably preparing his remarks for that public address that he'll be making less than 30 minutes from now. Craig, back to you. All right, Peter Alexander for there at uh, 1600 Pennsylvania, again, roughly 15 minutes away, uh, maybe a little longer from President Trump addressing the country. Um, just uh, four hours, a little over four hours now uh, since that shooting at a park in Northern Virginia during a, a, a practice uh, for a congressional ba baseball game set to happen tomorrow at Nationals Field. Yeah, and we have a, a shooter identified as a, a man in his late 60s with an Illinois driver's license, Belleville, Illinois, unclear where he was living. Um, he, he was shot by police in an exchange of gunfire. And that brings us to NBC News law enforcement analyst Jim Cavanaugh, who joins us. And Jim, you've been listening along with us. You've been listening as we've gotten bits and pieces of what transpired here. What are your thoughts this morning? Jim Cavanaugh, are you with us? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Savannah. I didn't get the first. Didn't get you were talking to me yet. Yeah. No, I thought it was a very, a very important interview there, uh, because what he described was the Capitol police officers keeping the shooter at bay. The two officers, the one was wounded in the ankle, and so when they're engaging him, he's not able to shoot the members of Congress and the staff aides and the people in the ballpark. He now has to focus on the gunfire coming from the two Capitol police officers. Then Alexandria police uniform arrives and they start engaging him and, you know, they, they take him down. A uh, combination of Capitol Police and Alexandria stopped the guy in his tracks. Critical to the whole thing. Uh, also the witness describing the crack of rifle fire. You heard the witness say, you know, how loud it was, how loud that rifle fire is. It sounds like a crack. It's like nothing you hear when you're in a, when you're in a ball field like that or in a, in a closed in area where trees around it. It's very, very loud. Any type of a uh, semi-automatic military style rifle. You're not going to not know what that is. You're going to yeah. hear that. And people start scattering. So the distance event is, is critical too because that's probably what saves Representative Scalise and, and, and the third base uh, member yeah. because the distance, the guy's not quite as accurate you know, he, to, to be able to do it. If he was good with a rifle it could have been a lot worse or if the people were you know, uh, in the dugout when he when he con confronted them, it could have been a whole lot worse. Absolutely. Everybody really thanking their lucky stars that the Capitol Hill police were there and the Alexandria police following so quickly. Jim, thank you. We want to go to Pete Williams, who's working the phones. Pete, what more have you got? Well, we've been, uh, Savannah, trying to get a clear picture of who was shot here. We know two Capitol police officers who, who are said to be uh, going to be okay. Congressman Scalise, a staffer for Congressman Roger Williams of Texas, the gunman. And now we are, we have confirmed that um, 
a lobbyist was also shot. He is named as Matt Micah, M-I-K-A, Matt Micah, who is director of government relations for Tyson's Food uh, in the Washington area. Uh, his company says he's been taken to the hospital, that they're awaiting word on his condition, that he's worked for Tyson Foods for more than six years. And the company says we're deeply concerned about him and his family. Mm -hmm. So we don't know how serious his, his uh, wounds are. Uh, but this would, this would be a sixth person, a fifth victim, plus the gunman for six people shot. Um, and we're, we're still, as you just said a moment ago, Savannah, we're trying to determine what the condition is of the gunman uh, to know whether uh, he's going to survive the wounds and whether they've been able to talk to him and get any information out of him about why he uh, did this. And Pete, I mean, you were, I'm not sure if you heard it, but we had Congressman Fleischman uh, on with Casey Hunt just a few moments ago who had mentioned someone named Micah. Now we're putting it together as you reveal the name. It's a, a lobbyist named Matt Micah. And he had, the congressman said that he, he saw that this individual was shot in the chest, which is uh, very disturbing. So I, I right. you know, will continue to follow yeah, that. And I, I, think, I think you get some sense of that because of the statement saying we're deeply concerned about him and yes. his family. Yes. All right. Uh, Pete Williams uh, standing by for us. Pete, thanks. We'll come back to you um, in, in just a bit. Uh, we should also note that this congressional baseball game that, that's set to happen tomorrow, um, it was actually set to start uh, with the British ambassador who was going to throw out the first pitch uh, to honor the victims of terror in, in London and in Manchester um, as well. Again, this is an annual, as you indicated earlier, Samantha, an annual rite of passage uh, especially for the, the Beltway crowd. This is something that, that happens uh, every year, a fundraiser for schools in that area. We heard from a lawmaker a short time ago say, you know, last year they raised uh, roughly $600,000. At this point, uh, no firm indication as to whether the game will, will go on, but we've heard from a, a number of lawmakers, um, several of whom were at the field this morning, um, saying that the game should, in fact, uh, go on, perhaps uh, with a renewed sense of purpose. We'll see. Uh, we are awaiting remarks from the president in a matter of moments from the White House. We expect at noon to hear from the House Speaker Paul Ryan and Nancy Pelosi, the Democratic leader. Um, and I just received a, an email that went out to all members of Congress saying come to the House floor to hear their remarks at noon today. Let's go to NBC's Hans Nicholas. He's at the hospital where Congressman Scalise underwent surgery. We understand he's out of surgery. Hans, good morning. What can you tell us? Savannah, that's right. He has been uh, out of surgery. That's according to two congressmen, uh, some of whom have spoken with the majority whips police. This here is the hospital. I mean, you can see the emergency room entrance right here. This is likely where he came in. And this is a hospital here in northwest D.C. where they do a lot of specialty work. They're not necessarily focused on trauma here. The main trauma hospital in D.C. is George Washington University. That's a teaching hospital down towards the White House just a little bit more, where there are also two victims of this shooting. Attack. Now, what the hospital is confirming is that the majority whip, Steve Scalise, is here. They are not saying anything about the status of his condition, where he is right now in terms of the surgery. But we can confirm, according to two congresspeople who have spoken with Scalise, that he is out of surgery and in good spirits. Savannah? Hans, thank you very much. Outside the hospital in the Washington area where Congressman Scalise underwent surgery and we're pleased to say is uh, said to be doing well. And Peter Alexander, as we look at the scene here and the, the familiar, unfortunately, yellow crime scene tape that we see at the baseball field, uh, Peter Alexander is over at the White House and we know that the president is expected to speak in a few minutes. Peter, what more can you tell us? Yeah, Savannah, that's right. You can now see the live picture. This is the diplomatic room here at the White House where we are expecting to hear from President Trump. Uh, the timing is set for 1130 today, so that means he should be speaking within the next 10 minutes or so. It's been quite a somber scene here at the White House over much of this morning for my colleagues who are up in the West Wing a little bit earlier trying to reach out to the communication staff. The communication staff held their early meeting today as they normally would, then tried to sort out exactly what the best plan of action was. Of course, the priority was making sure that everybody was safe and that everything was being done to make sure that this was not a wider threat. After that, obviously, the concern focused on what the president might say, the opportunity for the president to speak to some of those individuals involved. We've now confirmed that he has spoken to the wife of Congressman Steve Scalise, as well as his chief of staff, to Paul Ryan, as well as the, uh, the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell as well. He's been huddling with members of his team over much of this morning, including the vice president. What's striking is how close to home 
home. This tragedy hits to so many individuals who work here at the White House. You'll remember Reince Priebus, formerly the chairman of the RNC, the Republican National Committee, Sean Spicer, his head of communications, one of the chief spokespeople for the RNC before President Trump, then brought them on board and brought them here to the White House. So the relationships between this White House and many of these Republican lawmakers go back quite some way. It's why President Trump himself today, who has had Steve Scalise and some of these other lawmakers over here for meetings in the past, was quick to point out, as he describes Scalise as a true friend, uh, excuse me, a true friend and patriot. So that's the situation here. This will also be sort of a striking moment because President Obama, of course, preceding President Trump, was put in this, uh, this undesirable position on too many occasions of speaking about following situations where gun violence often took the lives of too many innocent Americans. We hope and pray, of course, today that nobody loses their life as a result of this tragedy. And at this point, it appears that everybody who was hurt was only wounded, uh, not killed. Nonetheless, it's one of those rare moments where you get to see a president at a time of crisis. Uh, they help try to soothe uh, the anxieties that Americans may be feeling and may try to sort of capture a moment of bipartisanship as they try to bring Americans together, uh, not Republicans or Democrats, just Americans in the wake of this awful tragedy. Now that would be um, certainly called for in this moment where I think a lot of people are just hurting and, and just so sad to see what's happened at what should be a very um, happy collegial event. Um, leading up to this baseball game in D.C. It's just it's just hard to even fathom that we're talking about that. Six people shot. Uh, our justice correspondent, Pete Williams, uh, confirming that uh, just a few moments ago. Six shot. That's including uh, the gunman. Uh, this is a Facebook post from a staffer who was shot this morning. His name is Zach Barth, and I believe we have the post that we can uh, we can put on the screen here. This is from Zach Barth. I got shot this morning at the baseball fields. But I am in the hospital and okay. Thank you uh, for the thoughts and prayers. So this was the aide to Congressman Roger Williams. Yes, Texas. From Texas. Yes, and he had mentioned that his staffer had been shot but was okay. But it's nice to hear from him directly on his Facebook page. And I'm sure he's got so many people worried about him. And um, as we understand it, he, he's going to be okay. Apparently, because he's already able to Facebook. He's post. already Facebooking. <laughs> but um, we, we have learned in the last hour of another individual who was shot this morning, um, said to be a lobbyist by the name of Matt Micah. And we await word on his condition. We have the two Capitol Hill police, excuse me, the two police officers. I'm not sure if they're both Capitol Hill police officers who were shot and said to be in good condition by the police chief. They are expected to be okay as well. That lobbyist is a lobbyist for uh, Tyson Foods. Again, uh, we are just maybe seven minutes or so away from President Trump addressing the nation. Also at noon, we uh, are told that uh, House Speaker Paul Ryan and his counterpart on the other side of the aisle, Nancy Pelosi, uh, will also be addressing uh, not just lawmakers in, in this situation, but also addressing uh, the nation as well. We've heard from a number of people uh, this morning. There was one eyewitness who was in the YMCA uh, who detailed just a harrowing account of, of how it all went down shortly after seven, the bullets piercing the glass uh, at the Y. He talked about being able to see the shooter uh, crouch down, appearing to take aim at these at these folks on the baseball field. And he ended that account um, by calling for civility mm -hmm. and calling for an end to the sometimes heated political uh, discourse and rhetoric uh, that has come to define our politics here in this country. I would say as of late, but it really hasn't been as of late. It's been for some time now. Yeah, um, as far as the investigation is concerned, we're told by our producer, Andrew Blankstein, that uh, the ATF is now doing an emergency trace on two firearms, one rifle and one handgun, and that comports with what we've heard from witnesses at the scene. Several witnesses, members of Congress, thought that uh, the shooter had two two guns. Um, right. Let's look at this news conference. Uh, Joe Barton among those speaking. Let's listen. Alexandra police who arrived very quickly 
who, who, who attacked, I can't emphasize this, and that they attacked the shooter, and that saved our lives. Thank where, you. And in doing so, got injured themselves. It's remarkable that, heroism. And yeah. uh, Where were the Capitol uh, Police when they first engaged the shooter? They were out behind the first base dugout where it's... Congressman Meehan said they normally position themselves. They were not on the field. The shooter was not on the field and never got on the field. He stayed behind the third base dugout and came around behind home plate, got behind the utility shed, and then darted out in front of the utility shed, and that's when he got shot. Did you see the shooter and the weapon? I did not until after the fact. I was getting down, protecting, making sure my son was down, and. I, I did not see him when it was an active shooting situation. But we just left Jeff Duncan from South Carolina. Jeff generally plays shortstop or third base, Trent Kelly. And uh, Jeff was leaving with another member, uh, Ron DeSantis, who would have all been positioned in the infield. Uh, as is customary, we all have responsibilities to get back to. So sometimes people will finish what they're doing and leave a little early. As Jeff was walking out, he actually saw the shooter who spoke to him and said, uh, you know, who are those guys? He said, that's the congressional baseball team. He said, what are they, Republicans or Democrats? And he said, they're the Republicans. And uh, that was the conversation he had, and it was only as they were driving back that they heard the news reports. And they said he acted a little reports. weird yeah. when he did. Anyway, we need to go inside. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so How much. long did the firefight go on for? Guys, make it back, please. That was uh, Congressman uh, Patrick Meehan, Republican from Pennsylvania, along with uh, Congressman uh, Joe Bart from Texas, uh, who we heard from just a short time ago. Also uh, with the Congressman from Texas, his 10-year-old son, Jack, who was at the field. Two of his sons were there. With him yeah. um, this morning. Uh, but again, we, it sounds like we heard another corroboration of that, that story that we've heard from a, a number of folks this morning, that the gunman apparently at some point uh, before opening fire asked whether they're, those are Republicans or Democrats on the field uh, playing baseball. Um, so there's that. We've heard, yeah, we've heard an account, varying accounts along those lines all morning long. And, and then the other fact that stands out is one that Senator Paul had mentioned earlier on this morning on NBC, which was that they have been practicing there for yeah. the last couple of months. So this was, um, presumably, if someone wanted to target it, particular individuals, they would have known that this is where these members of Congress and their staff play baseball, all leading up, of course, to this congressional baseball game for charity that was to play, take place tomorrow. It's 11, almost 1130 on the East Coast, and we're coming up on the time when we expect to hear from President Trump from the White House. He's expected to speak there. That's the live shot we have from inside the West Wing. And we will also hear uh, at noon time, we're told, from the House Speaker Paul Ryan and the Democrats leader in the House, Nancy Pelosi. They're expected to address um, their members of Congress. In fact, uh, the call has gone out on the Hill to say, if you're a member of Congress, come and, and listen to what the leaders have to say as we uh, you know, await further word of how the injured are doing. We are learning more about the shooter, the suspected shooter at this hour. His name is James Hodgkinson, uh, 66 years old. He has an illness driver's license according uh, to law enforcement sources although at this point it is not clear um, whether he was living in the area at the time let's go to Tom Costello interviewing another eyewitness let's listen the congressional calendar uh, and then to have a tragedy like this uh, thrust upon it is really a terrible thing thank you and who did you work for doesn't matter and what do you do now uh, work for government relations all right thank you appreciate it Tom's just putting his ear paint. Tom, I know you just put your earpiece in. We didn't. We only cut the tail end of what that witness was saying. What did he well, say I'll tell to you? you? What? I, well, thank you. Uh, sorry about that. We're talking to David Woodruff. We're now live. Uh, talk to me a little about, once again, what did you hear? What did you see? Yeah, so I was out for a run. I live about a mile and a half west of here in Alexandria. I was out for a run this morning. Uh, I was going right up past Simpson Field. Happened to glance over and see the fact that uh, folks were out playing baseball at such an early hour in the morning, not recognizing they were members of Congress at that point. I uh, didn't think much of it. Kept running and not a second later heard an initial volley of about 12 or 14 shots go off. Took a few more paces and heard another uh, volley of about four or five shots at that point recognized that uh, this was a dangerous situation and I better get cover and went into a parking garage it was right across the street and called 911 uh, I was down in the parking garage for about five or six minutes the situation looked like it got uh, under control pretty quickly Alexandria PD was here pretty fast uh, I came back up out of the garage and saw two members of Congress I was familiar with and went over and talked to them briefly and uh, they were pretty distraught you could tell uh, knowing what we know now about what unfolded on that baseball diamond 
uh, certainly uh, you could see the look in their eyes that they were very concerned about uh, about Mr. Scalise and all the folks who were, who were involved. Tom, all we're right, gonna, thank you, David. Yes, thank Appreciate you. it. David Woodruff, he did not see the gunman, by the way. Yeah. Back to you. But, Tom, we're going to interrupt because we have with us right now Florida Congressman Ron DeSantis, who was there this morning. And, sir, as I understand it, you believe you spoke with the gunman in the parking lot of the field. What, what did you hear? Tell us your experience. Well, we were out there uh, practicing with everybody else. I was playing third base. Jeff Duncan from South Carolina was playing short. Steve Scalise was playing second, taking ground balls. Jeff and I looked at each other. We said, hey, we've got a good workout. Let's get on the road so we can beat the traffic. So we left probably five, ten minutes before all this started. Uh, when we were in the car, an individual uh, came up to us and asked us whether they were Republicans or Democrats on the field. Jeff told them it was Republicans. He kind of turned and then walked towards the field after that. And so we kind of, it was a little strange, but we didn't think necessarily anything of it. By the time we got back to Capitol Hill and the news broke, Jeff and I immediately talked to each other. We said, look, we've got to report this guy. So we reported it to the police. And now that he's been identified in his photo, uh, both Congressman Duncan and myself believe that, yes, the individual that approached us was the same individual who's been identified as the shooter. So, OK, so you you spoke to this individual and then you've subsequently seen a picture of the suspect and you believe these are the, the person that asked you, is it Republicans or Democrats? Is that's the right. person who is the shooter? That, that's right. I think the I think the, the photos that we've seen match the description of the individual that approached uh, approached Duncan's vehicle. Did law enforcement show you those photos and ask for for you to confirm the identity of the person you spoke to? No, I, I reported to Capitol Police um, once his name was identified. I went on. I just typed his name into Google Images. He has a Twitter account from the town in Illinois that he's been identified from. I immediately sent it to Duncan. I said, Jeff, this is him, right? Jeff said, yeah, that's him. And so we're both in agreement that that was the guy that approached the vehicle. So he walked away from our vehicle. And I think it was, you know, five or 10 minutes later that he started shooting. Congressman, um, had, had you not left when you did, is it our understanding that you would have been right there in, in the line of fire? I would have been at third base. So he was shooting from the third base side at Scalise, who was playing second. I would have been much closer to the shooter. Jeff playing shortstop would have been closer as well. And so it's just the type of thing where, you know, we obviously were just trying to beat some traffic. Did never thought that you'd ever have any incident like this. But had we just decided to stay a little longer, I mean, who knows what would have happened? It's just, I, I still don't think I've come to terms with, with what's happened yet. Well, that's understandable. Congressman, it, it, to the extent you can, what was, what was the demeanor of the shooter? I'm sure at the moment you probably didn't think anything of it, but when you look back at it now and run it through your mind, does anything stand out? It was a little odd just because, I mean, this is a public field. There's people that are around, people walk their dogs and everything, but it's not the type of thing that anyone necessarily goes and watches. And he was really interested in whether it was Republicans or Democrats, then he immediately turned to the field. So I just kind of thought it was odd. I didn't think it was dangerous or anything like that, and neither did Jeff. Uh, but then once we heard kind of news of it, immediately it just clicked and we said look this guy may have been it we've got to report him so i think sometimes things are a little odd but then in hindsight once something happens you're like oh man this kind of fits and then once i saw the picture i was like oh boy this is the guy yeah, and you know congressman i think we have an image that our we can now picture. share this is our first picture i don't know i don't think you can see our signal can you right now do you have a monitor i cannot there? i cannot. cannot see it. it well we're showing a picture of a man looks to be in his late 60s of course we now know he's been identified by law enforcement to nbc as james hodgkinson um but presumably that might be close to the picture you saw and you and congressman duncan having uh, interacted with him how, this is this <laughs> how do you feel i guess is a, the question now congressman desantis i mean when you know what happened, you know your colleague Steve Scalise was shot, you know other staffers were shot and Capitol Police officer. I mean, how, what is going through your mind right now? Well, one, thank God for the Capitol Police. I mean, Steve Scalise, as a member of leadership, travels with a security detail. Um, had Steve not come to practice this morning, you would not have had any security there at all. And I think this guy would have injured and killed a number of people. I think it would have been very ugly. 
Uh, and so those Capitol Police saved a lot of lives today. Um, I also think just about Steve personally. He's a really good, cheerful guy, and he loves this congressional baseball game. And we've already raised 650000 for charity. He dresses up in a nice uniform every practice. He was really happy with me that I was playing this year, and every time he'd see me on the House floor, he'd be like, thanks for coming out. You're ripping the ball. You're doing great. We need you, man. Stay, stay with it. And so he was really looking forward to playing in the game, and it looks like he's going to be fine. Thank God for that. Um, but I just, I don't know if they're going to play the game tomorrow night. Um, I'm willing to play if they do, but it's a type of thing. It will be a little sad if Steve's not able to play, given how much it means to him. Congressman, uh, President Trump expected to address the country here any moment now. What do you want to hear from the president? Well, I think that, you know, the president just needs to um, let the American people know that Steve's a great guy, um, ask the American people to pray for a full recovery, as well as the others who were injured there. Um, I don't draw any major conclusions yet on this. I mean, okay. I'm finding out some Congressman, Congressman, yeah. Sorry. shortly after 7 a.m. this morning, a gunman opened fire on members of Congress and their staffs as they were practicing for tomorrow's annual charity baseball game. Authorities are continuing to investigate the crime, and the assailant has now died from his injuries. The FBI is leading the investigation and will continue to provide updates as new information becomes available. Congressman Steve Scalise, a member of House leadership, was shot and badly wounded and is now in stable condition at the hospital, along with two very courageous Capitol Police officers. At least two others were also wounded. Many lives would have been lost if not for the heroic actions of the two Capitol Police officers who took down the gunman despite sustaining gunshot wounds during a very, very brutal assault. Melania and I are grateful for their heroism and praying for the swift recovery of all victims. Congressman Scalise is a friend and a very good friend. He's a patriot and he's a fighter. He will recover from this assault. And Steve, I want you to know that you have the prayers not only of the entire city behind you, but of an entire nation and, frankly, the entire world. America is praying for you, and America is praying for all of the victims of this terrible shooting. I spoke with Steve's wife, Jennifer, and I pledge to her our full and absolute support, anything she needs. We're with her and with the entire Scalise family. I have also spoken with Chief Matthew Verderosa. He's doing a fantastic job of the Capitol Police to express our sympathies for his wounded officers and to express my admiration for their courage. Our brave Capitol Police perform a challenging job with incredible skill, and their sacrifice makes democracy possible. We also commend the brave first responders from Alexandria Police Fire and Rescue, who rushed to the scene. Everyone on that field is a public servant. Our courageous police, our congressional aides, who work so tirelessly behind the scenes with enormous devotion, and our dedicated members of Congress who represent our people. We may have our differences, but we do well in times like these to remember that everyone who serves in our nation's capital is here because, above all, they love our country. We can all agree that we are blessed to be Americans, that our children deserve to grow up in a nation of safety and peace, and that we are strongest when we are unified and when we work together 
for the common good. Please take a moment today to cherish those you love and always remember those who serve and keep us safe. God bless them all. God bless you. And God bless America. Thank you. President Trump speaking for just a few moments from the White House and sounding a note of bipartisanship, offering his condolences, of course, um, and his, his well wishes to Steve Scalise and the others who were injured, and announcing that the suspect, this James T. Hodgkinson, has died from his injuries, um, something that Pete Williams had uh, been looking into and had mentioned that the injuries appeared to be serious. Pete, uh, does this comport with what you had been hearing as well? Yeah, I think actually, Savannah, that uh, he probably died about an hour, maybe a little over an hour ago. Uh, he was taken, we're told, to GW Hospital, George Washington University Hospital here in Washington, D.C., along with, I think, some of the other shooting victims. And we had heard uh, an hour ago, uh, beginning, beginning to hear from uh, law enforcement officials that they thought he had died in the hospital. And we had uh, been waiting for a third source on that uh, when the president uh, announced it. So uh, w it, it seems doubtful that uh, they ever got any information out of him. Whether he said anything when he was transported to the hospital that was useful, we don't know yet. But um, just Recently, uh, just a few minutes ago, a law enforcement official told me that obviously a big question now is what was his motive? Uh, he's, he's got social media in which he's expressed some political views. Uh, you heard from the members of Congress that he asked, are these the Republicans or the Democrats that are playing? But what role that is, just they, law enforcement can't go merely on what's on his social media and what he, that kind of a comment. They're, they're now pressing to try to find out exactly what the motivation was here. So they'll be searching his house, they'll be talking to relatives, they'll be uh, trying to get a better picture of why he came here, what he had in mind, whether he told anyone when he came here, but uh, it's obvious that they knew who he was or felt they had a pretty good idea who he was shortly after the shooting when all the shots were fired and, and they could get to him. They found an Illinois driver's license in his pocket. And that is what started the urgent work to try to figure out uh, who he was and where he came from and why he did this. The second line of inquiry is the weapons. Two weapons are being traced. There's an urgent trace underway now by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms to figure out when and where he bought those weapons. If it was very recent, that may be a, another uh, piece that will help them understand this. But um, obviously this investigation now takes a very different course. Uh, if there's not going to be a prosecution here, it goes in a different direction. But uh, now a question is, was anyone else involved? Did anyone help him? Did anyone egg him on? Did he tell anyone else about his plans? So they're, they're still trying to figure all of that out. It's still very, very early and no way to answer those questions yet. But uh, something to emphasize that we've been saying all morning, and only because of the times we live in, that there's no indication here that this was inspired by any kind of a terrorist group. All right. Our justice correspondent, uh, Pete Williams there. Pete, um, thank you. It was also interesting to hear President Trump, again, only speaking for a few minutes there. Um, we may have our differences, but everyone is here in Washington, D.C., because uh, we love our country. Casey Hunt at the Capitol, where members of Congress are about to be briefed on today's shooting. Uh, Casey? Craig, we have moved from where we spoke to you last, which is on the second floor of the Capitol building, down to outside of the Congressional Auditorium, which is where this all-hands uh, meeting will take place to talk about what happened today. And you may see some members of Congress walk behind me into that meeting. Uh, Congressman Jeff Duncan of South Carolina just stopped to speak uh, to reporters about his experience. Pretty remarkable. He was with Congressman uh, DeSantis when uh, a man who now uh, seems to share that same description as the man who who's been identified as the shooter here, spoke to them and asked, are, are these Democrats or are these Republicans who are practicing on the field? And they gave him an answer. They said, these are Republicans. And uh, Mr. Duncan said he looked up at his clock to see how long it would take them to get back to the Capitol as they were departing. And that was at 7.02, so just a few minutes uh, before the terrible events uh, that unfolded today. So uh, we're now hearing uh, the, the Congresswoman who represents the district where Gabrielle Giffords, of course, 
journalist was shot at a town hall meeting, uh, is now speaking to reporters as well. And I have to say, uh, on a personal note, we work every day with the Capitol Police officers who, of course, uh, many of these Congress people have said were the heroes of this story. They are down here handing out uh, pins with the Capitol Police shield. Craig. President Trump saying that um, that those gunmen were, excuse me, that those uh, officers were able to take down the gunmen despite being hit themselves. The story of heroism yeah. on the part of the Capitol Hill police officers is something we've heard again and again this morning. We want to go to Tom Costello. He's been at the scene all morning in Alexandria, Virginia. Tom, good morning. I know you've spoken to a lot of witnesses. Yeah, and what's re what's really remarkable is how consistent the stories have been, Savannah. You know, uh, as you cover news events over the years, very often the initial reports turn out to be not so true, or maybe the initial impressions end up morphing into something that's different by the time the facts are sorted out. But at the moment, uh, most of the facts that have been stated by these witnesses, most of their descriptions of what happened have been pretty consistent. And that is that they dealt with, or that rather they heard, dozens or perhaps hundreds Hundreds of rounds being fired that they thought that it was at least a, a semi-automatic weapon and maybe also in addition to that a handgun that this individual who's described uh, as a uh, as a short shorter stocky mid uh, middle-aged man we now know in his late 60s that he approached uh, people before this whole went, thing went down and said is that the Republicans or the Democrats practicing for the game and they said Republicans and then shortly thereafter the the shooting began uh, I arrived uh, really very quickly on the scene, I would say within 40 minutes, and, and immediately I ran across, I came across a witness who said that she was there on the field when this whole thing went down, and that in fact, uh, she didn't know that they were Capitol Hill police officers, but that officers were engaging and returning fire with the suspect, and that one of those officers was shot and was down, that they brought in an EMS chopper for that officer. We now know there were two officers shot, and then of course, we also have a congressional staffer and we've got the suspect as well, and we have uh, Congressman Scalise. So those reports of how that all went down, how many shots were fired, the type of weapon that was involved, the description of the suspect, uh, the condition of those victims. We'd heard that there were three red, in other words, quite serious, and two yellow, not as serious. And now we know one of those, the suspect has died. All of that has been consistent throughout the morning. The other important headline for the people living in this immediate community is that the police have gone out of their way to say this is a, they believe, a lone gunman, that they, they did a complete sweep of the neighborhood uh, in the immediate aftermath of this incident, and they, they scoured the area to make sure that there wasn't another suspect at large, and they were convinced that there was not, that this was isolated, one gunman taken out by Capitol Hill police. Uh, and by the way, I, you know, I'm, I'm curious what, what you would hear from Casey Hunt, but as it relates to Capitol Hill police, you know, the fact that you had the GOP whip here obviously meant that there was a little bit of a higher level of security. If this had only been uh, junior members of the House, I'm not sure if you would have the same level of Capitol Hill police presence here on this on this uh, baseball field. Guys, back to you. Well, any presence at all for that Yeah, matter. Tom, we've been hearing that same thing. Members of Congress, as you know, as Craig knows, we've yeah. been covering Washington for a long time. They generally walk around without any security whatsoever, but because Scalise is in the leadership, it had a, some kind of a detail with him, and obviously those officers performed performed heroically this morning by all accounts. I just saw a tweet from a Congressman Swalwell, Democrat of California, who says that the congressional baseball game will be played tomorrow. Um, and it will obviously be for charity, but this Congressman says it will also be for the victims and the heroic officers who took down the shooter. Here, here. Yeah. Um, Jim Cavanaugh is an NBC News law enforcement analyst. Uh, Jim standing by for us as well. Uh, Jim, word from the president just a few moments ago that the gunman is dead besides in the obvious way. Um, how does this change the investigation other than not being able to talk uh, to the gunman? Well, it always hurts a little, Craig, you know, because you want to interview the shooter for sure to get to hear the motive directly from his mouth. Uh, and we don't know if he was killed by fire from Capitol Police, Alexandria Police, a combination, or may have even put a bullet in his own head once he was wounded. Clearly, he knew he was on a mission that likely wouldn't end, you know, with him escaping. We could find a suicide note from this guy. Um, and it's likely a guy, I mean, it has to be investigated. Now there's not going to be a prosecution of this guy. So if he's a lone actor, uh, you know, there'll be no prosecution of him. Uh, so it, it has to be looked at like he's a man choking on an empty grudge, really. 
Uh, you know, when you look at the motives for violent crime, greed, power, hate, revenge, and escape. And it's going to fall right in there. It's not going to be greed or escape. It's going to be uh, power, revenge, hate. We might get that from his writings. And uh, it's hard to get somebody else in your grudge, even if it's a political grudge. And, uh, but this clearly, uh, the sack of the FBI couldn't say it. I've been in that position. He wouldn't say it. But I'm a retired uh, SAC, special agent in charge, and I'm an analyst, and I can analyze, and I can say it. This was clearly an attempt to assassinate members of Congress. There's no question about it. He went there. He's from Illinois. He went to outside of D.C. He asked the questions. We heard the congressman say it directly. He asked if they were Republicans or Democrats. He was clearly there to assassinate members of Congress. So when you look at a suspect like that, you've got to look at the motives for assassins. And you've got to look at why they're doing it. And that's going to play a role in the investigation that the authorities are now conducting. You know, what was his motive to kill members of Congress? And, of course, that can be just a, a it's going to be, it's not going to make sense to any of us, but it's going to make sense in his mind. And it's going to be similar to other uh, grudges and uh, things that assassins sometimes act on. They collect all those grievances. They think they were wronged. Uh, sometimes they shoot up their employer. Sometimes they shoot at politicians, yeah. leaders, presidents, congressmen. All right, Jim. Uh, Jim, thanks. We, we want to get back to Casey Hunt on Capitol Hill. Casey, you understand you've got some new information for us? Craig, that's right. Members are coming out of this all-members briefing on this shooting with some news about the congressional baseball game itself, that game uh, that raises money for charity. Speaker Ryan telling this group of members that the game will go on tomorrow as planned, and he received uh, a standing ovation at that announcement. And I have to say I've spoken with several members now today uh, who were at this practice, and they have almost to a person said the same thing, that they do want the game to go on. There are some members who have suggested that maybe they should switch up the teams a little bit. Typically, the Democrats play against the Republicans. It's all in good fun, but still a partisan breakdown. Some suggestions, maybe they will figure out a different way to split up the teams. But either way, it looks like the game, again, is going to go on. Craig. All right. Casey Hunt with some, uh, some, some breaking news. And we've heard, of course, Congressman Scalise, his, his colleague, was telling us what a fan he was of the game and how important it was mm -hmm. to him. And he said it was his hope that the game would go on. And, of course, with special purpose now, Congressman Scalise, meanwhile, is still in the hospital but out of surgery and we're told doing well and in good spirits. We're waiting word on the condition of at least one other of the victims, a man by the name of Matt Micah. Um, and we've heard, we've got a Facebook post from one of the people yes. that was shot today, um, a young man who was a, Congress, a congressional aide to Congressman Williams and he said he's doing much better as well. Congressman Scalise playing second base uh, for the Republicans on that team. Do Peter Alexander standing by force uh, there at the White House. And, and Peter, uh, a lot of folks were waiting to hear uh, President Trump, waiting to hear precisely in which direction yeah. he might go. Um, it was a, a, a message of unification, if you will, saying at one point, when we work together for the common good, we are at our best. Yeah, I think a lot of Americans will be appreciative for those words of unity from the president today. Uh, notably, for a little color behind the scenes in that room, the diplomatic room here at the White House, the president was joined by his vice president, who was just behind the cameras, as well as his daughter, Ivanka Trump, her husband, Jared Kushner, and Stephen Miller, one of his chief st speech writers, who uh, ultimately was the one who helped craft those remarks that we heard from the president a short time ago. We did hear from Ivanka Trump a little bit ago as well. She just posted the following on Twitter. She said, our thoughts and prayers are are with Representative Scalise and others injured in this morning's terrible incident. Grateful to the first responders. This is going to be a different day here at the White House. The president did have a public schedule. He was supposed to be heading to the Department of Labor this afternoon. Instead, they're going to have uh, some meetings as planned taking place here, but it's certainly not going to follow the plans that they had initially had for this day as the White House tries to sort of wrap its arms around what happened here. And I think tomorrow, as you were just talking with Casey, is really going to be one of those unique moments where there's an opportunity really after a just divisive campaign season in first few months of this administration like we have rarely seen in this country's history for all members of all sides to gather together in a big baseball stadium and, and try to come together in agreement that we're all Americans before we're Republicans and Democrats. We have not yet found out whether the president will be attending tomorrow night's game or the vice president, Mike Pence. We have just reached out to the White House for any more detail on that. All right, It Peter. should be a powerful symbol, though, America's favorite pastime being played in our country.
country's capital um, in the wake of this. Peter, thank you. Hopefully a moment of unity. Uh, NBC's Hans Nichols is at the hospital where Congressman Scalise underwent surgery a little bit earlier. Hans, do you have any kind of update for us? We don't have any update on Scalise. We do have an update on Matt Mika. He's the lobbyist for Tyson's Foods. I actually know him through a basketball group, and so a lot of his friends are putting together thoughts and prayers. Uh, hopefully we have a picture up for him. He worked for about 10 years at Tyson's Food. Before that, worked from a lawmaker from Michigan. He has been shot about four to five times, according to friends of his, four to five times, including chest wounds, and he is somewhere between critical and stable condition. So it gives you a sense, guys, and I know that Washington a lot in the news is about the partisan conflict going back. It really is a small village. You really do know someone everywhere you go. There's a chance you could bump into someone, whether a Democrat, a Republican, or a reporter. And this is just one example of how the, the casualty and the, the, the shooting, the four or five shots that hit Mike, uh, Matt Micah, is affecting a broader group. A lot of thoughts going out back, back and forth, bipartisan, Republican staffers, Democratic staffers, all trying to pull together for someone that they knew. And just in general, there's a mixture of shock and outrage. A lot of folks I've talked to this morning that either worked for Scalise or know him or have passed him in the hall and other congressmen and staffers, they're just outraged that something like this could happen. So right now, everyone's thoughts and prayers are with everyone who is affected, and we're waiting for more of an update. Behind me, you see the entry into the emergency room here at MedStar. This is one of two big hospitals. They do trauma here. There's a big children's hospital here. They're really known for their specialty work here. The other trauma hospital, of course, is George Washington University, a little bit further downtown, where some of the other victims have been taken as well. Guys? All right, Hans Nichols for us there. Hans, uh, thank you. Earlier this morning, a short time ago, we heard from Texas Congressman Joe Barton. Uh, he's actually the manager of this, this baseball team. He was at the ba baseball practice this morning. He actually brought his young son with him as well. Let's just listen to a portion of that interview. Look, we, we were at batting practice. We have a congressional baseball game we play every year. Uh, a shooter came out to practice started shooting. He shot at Trent Kelly, our third baseman. He shot at Steve Scalise, our second baseman. He hit Steve Scalise. There, the Scalise's security detail and the Capitol Hill police immediately began. To return fire. And Alexander police also immediately came and began to return fire. They shot the shooter, and I think the security detail saved a lot of lives because they attacked the shooter. So the heroes are the Capitol Hill Police, Alexander Police, and Steve Scalise's security detail. Do you know what the shooter looked like? He, he was a middle-aged um, man, um, blue jeans and a blue shirt. Uh, I think he was Anglo. and. Uh, he had, a, he had a, a rifle, and I think he had an automatic pistol, but I wouldn't swear to that. Can you at least tell us what it must have been like in this idyllic setting to suddenly have this kind of thing? Control? Well, look, there's going to be all kinds of, you know, I'm the manager of the team. Um, several people, the security people were hit. One of our staffers were hit. Scalise was hit. Uh, I've talked to the speaker. I've talked to the Capitol Hill police. I'm sure there'll be some sort of a general statement later on, but luckily no one appeared to be killed. And again, I, I just want to thank the security detail because Is they saved their lives. Detail? That was Congressman Joe Barton a little bit earlier talking about his experience this morning. Can you imagine not all that he witnessed, but with his son? I think he said he had actually two sons yeah. who were there at the baseball game. I, I believe we have a live shot of what we understand to be the suspect's home in Belleville, Illinois. That's the scene. And then we see a member of law enforcement standing outside there. Let's bring in Pete Williams, who's uh, on this part of the story for us. Hi, Pete. You can see ATF folks there. Uh, the, there are lots of agencies involved with this. Now, you may well ask yourself, well, why are they just standing there? And my guess would be that they're waiting for a search warrant. That's the way these things normally go. Um, the, uh, the authorities, when they get someone's identity, uh, although they've had this identity now, I think, for probably four hours, 
but how long it will take them to get a search warrant. And in fact, since we're just getting these pictures now and we're all seeing them for the first time, perhaps they've already received it and are inside and these are uh, people that are outside uh, protecting the area while it's being searched. But that's this is going to be the standard uh, response here is to get um, once you have the person identified, and as we've been saying, they moved pretty quickly on this because there was a driver's license, we're told, that the suspect had in his pocket, and that allowed them to begin to uh, try to get information on where this person was from. This person has been identified as James T. Hodgkinson of Belleville, Illinois, and that's where these pictures are coming from, from outside his residence. He was 66 years old, born December 12th of 1950. Uh, so he would turn 67 uh, in December. He would have turned 67 in December. Uh, but presumably that's the house. Uh, and um, the normal course is to get a search warrant to be able to go in and look for what they're obviously looking for is any information on how long he had planned this, whether other people were involved. But this is a standard investigative thing that we see after this. Uh, the, he, in terms of the motive, I mean, I should emphasize here that as we begin to discuss his past, there's been no official word on what the motive is because, frankly, they don't know. They're aware of what we can see publicly, which is that he had strong political views. He had expressed them on Facebook. He was a prolific writer of letters to the local newspaper. He often showed up at political events, uh, was a kind of a protester, uh, had very strong anti-Republican views. And, and there was a... Um, uh, a 2006 complaint of assault from his girlfriend uh, who say that uh, uh, she complained to the police that he pulled out her hair uh, but the charges were subsequently dropped we're told uh, because the girlfriend declined to press the charges after initially calling the police uh, but there's uh, as far as we know there's no really extensive violent criminal record here other than the domestic assault complaint that was never prosecuted, we're told. So uh, that's the big question here. What were his motives? Why did he do this? When did he come to the Washington area? When did he get the weapon that's been described by witnesses as a AK-47 type assault weapon? Witnesses have said that during the shooting, he reloaded with additional magazines or ammunition clips. So he came uh, certainly well armed to the baseball game this morning here in Washington. All right, our justice correspondent uh, Pete Williams there uh, filling in some of the gaps uh, on the suspect. Uh, again, the suspect, according to President Trump, uh, the suspect is dead. House Speaker Paul Ryan and Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi expected uh, to speak any moment now. Uh, Casey Hunt is standing by for us there at the Capitol. And Casey, let, let's start here. I'm, I'm curious to, to know whether lawmakers um, this morning have been talking about how they feel in terms of their level of security. Do lawmakers on Capitol Hill generally feel safe? Well, Craig, I think for the members that I've spoken to who were at this event, the answer this morning to that uh, is no. I think they felt very surprised, very shaken. Congressman Davis uh, told me, well, I'm never going back to that field again. And I think he, he needed to stop and kind of digest to see how he felt generally about uh, the security situation. And we're just learning more about this closed door meeting with all members, but I'm sure many of them will have uh, thoughts going forward. If you think about the level of resources it would take to individually protect each one of these members, uh, there's obviously 535 total, 100 in the Senate, 435 over here in the House. That's a significant uh, commitment. And one thing that many members of Congress pride themselves on, and that's kind of a hallmark uh, of both covering this building and of the way Congress operates, is its openness. And many, uh, you know, these members, uh, they walk freely through the halls. Uh, it's in many ways would be a very different life if they had individual security all of the time. So I'm sure uh, there are a lot of factors at play here. And there are only a handful of members of Congress that have regular uh, security details that travel with them all the time. Obviously, the House Speaker uh, is one of them, of course, in the presidential line of succession, in addition to holding uh, a very important job. And then you have the other uh, top leaders uh, in both 
both chambers that will travel with a smaller sized uh, detail. So Whip Scalise, for example, has fewer people who protect him every day than Speaker Ryan, uh, for example. So uh, look, I think this is going to be a conversation that's going to start today and evolve with time. Uh, and again, you may see behind me some of these uh, members of Congress coming out here to talk to us. So, uh, you know, I think, Craig, this is the beginning of a, of a, of a conversation that's going to take a while to work out. Craig. All right. Casey Hunt there uh, standing by for us ahead of comments from the from the speaker and um, Nancy Pelosi as well. Yeah, they're planning at noon Eastern time to have uh, Nancy Pelosi and Speaker Paul Ryan come out and address the members of Congress. They're obviously running a few moments behind, but we will continue to keep our eye on that building and bring it to you live when it happens. NBC's Tom Costello has been at the scene since early this morning. 7.09 is when this all started. And Tom, I think you were uh, about <laughs> there about a half hour afterward and have been hearing from witnesses all morning long. Yeah, do you mind if I bring in Julie Carey from our local affiliate, uh, WRC News 4 in Washington? You've been talking, well, let's preface yeah. it, all right? You are, this is one of the best reporters in Washington. You have been talking to people within Alexandria, who government or former members. What have you heard? Well, this is a, a you know, community YMCA. I work out here many mornings a week. So does the former mayor Alexand of Alexandria, Bill Ewell. And he was here early this morning on his way to the Y. He's had conversations with folks that work inside the Y in the mornings, and they believe they know this man that was the gunman. They say he's been coming to this Y for some time now. They say he was a very low-profile man, kept to himself for the most part, would maybe offer the former mayor a greeting, but would come to the Y, take a sauna in the morning, and then set up shop on his laptop in the front lobby. Um, and the other observation that the staffer at the Y gave to the mayor is that he canceled his Y membership on Monday. Now, again, law enforcement not confirming uh, that this... But these are people who are in the Y, and clearly this is right next to the ballpark. Right, right next to the ballpark. Um, uh, oh, in fact, another conversation that the Y staffer relayed to the former mayor was that some time ago, uh, this man that they believed to be the shooter had observed the uh, the men playing in the ballpark across the street. Normally, we see kids playing there, high schoolers and that sort of thing. And he asked, who's over there? Uh, the, and so he the, was... The alleged gunman the alleged had asked gunman that in the past. asked who was playing ball on the field, and he was told, yeah, those are members of Congress practicing for a game. Uh, so, so presumably, he, he was aware for a per some period of time, days, weeks, prior to the shooting that members of Congress were on the field practicing. That's what it sounds like. And I can tell you, though, as somebody, again, who works out at that Y regularly, there's no secret that members of Congress are there. They're driving their cars with the congressional license plates. So it's, it's also obvious to anybody who's observing. You know this community well, in part because you live close by. You report on this community. Uh, this is really uh, earth shattering for the folks who live around here. Yeah, it is. It's a real jolt. And, and this this park, this YMCA, the coffee shop across the street, this is really a hub of community activity. I mean, Delray is seen as one of the most popular areas in, in this whole region. And, uh, you know, while we have had some uh, bad crimes in Alexandria, including a, a serial killer that was on the loose some years ago. This is, is really a jolt, an attack right at the heart of the community. And, you know, then on the members of Congress, many of whom are our neighbors in Alexandria. It's a community filled with journalists and members of Congress. There are many in my neighborhood. Uh, but we're, when we're out here, we're just functioning as neighbors. So it's a real surprise. Thank you, Julie. Julie Carey from uh, News 4 WRC here in Washington. And we are so lucky to have her as a resource. Yeah. I call her all the time to ask her what she's hearing. Let me just, can I reiterate a point that Julie was making? Please. Um, for people who live in the greater Washington, D.C. area and who uh, have been covering politics or are involved in somehow in the government or are, you know, employed uh, in some fashion uh, within uh, businesses that deal with the government. Uh, yes, this is a political town, but I can tell you firsthand from conversations you have with neighbors and friends and at the gym or the bar, um, people have been awfully discouraged about the level of rancor, about the level of animosity, because yes. we do, everybody in this area does live with Republicans and Democrats, members of both parties, members who work on the Hill. Uh, you know people of both parties and uh, have been concerned about the level of animosity. Uh, and I think Julie did a nice job of kind of summing that up. She did, and we know Julie well from our time as Washington yeah. local reporters and appreciate her, her perspective and expertise. I want to read um, for that, from our Capitol Hill 
producer, Bernie Sanders, who of course ran for president, um, has just given a statement, or he's about to deliver it, but this is the written statement that says, he, Sanders says, I have just been informed that the alleged shooter at the Republican baseball practice is someone who apparently volunteered on my presidential campaign. Mr. Sanders goes on to say, I am sickened by this despicable act. Let me be as clear as I can be. Violence of any kind is unacceptable in our society, and I condemn this action in the strongest possible terms. The real change can only come about through nonviolent action, and anything else runs against our most deeply held American values. The statement goes on and obviously offers prayers and condolences and hopes for um, Congressman Scalise. But that's the first. There's been kind right. of rumors going around right. that potentially this suspect had been a supporter of Bernie Sanders. There's some social media posts that potentially said that, but this was the first somewhat official confirmation, Senator Sanders saying that he himself has been informed that this shooter had once volunteered for his campaign, and obviously Senator Sanders is quite disturbed and um, saying that, that it has no place in our society. This is, a, a, the, again, contributing to this, the picture that's starting to emerge of this 66-year-old uh, James. James Hodgkinson, um, and again, according to President Trump, he is dead. He was killed in that uh, shootout uh, with law enforcement at the baseball field or died perhaps uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, but again, Julie Carey just uh, also reporting on folks at the YMCA and again, the, the Y and the baseball part, uh, the baseball field essentially uh, but against each other. Uh, and according to, to, to Julie, and she mentioned Mayor Yule, Bill Yule, who I also know, longtime mayor of Alexandria, Virginia, saying, that this was a guy who'd been working out at the Y, perhaps sitting in the lobby on his laptop on a regular basis uh, before uh, canceling his membership on, on Monday, knew that Republicans had been, or knew that members of uh, the Republican Party, lawmakers had been practicing at this baseball field uh, for a number of, of weeks now. Um, and again, that uh, coming with, with Senator Sanders' statement there, this, this picture continuing uh, to emerge here. We are going to be hearing from House Speaker Paul Ryan. We saw uh, Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi just walk by uh, cameras a short time ago. We heard from President Trump a short time ago. Peter Alexander is at the White House. Uh, Peter? Craig, uh, good day to you and to Savannah right now. Yeah, we did hear for just shy of five minutes from the president speaking from the diplomatic room here at the White House. And besides his effort to sort of draw Americans together uh, on this day, he also broke the news of the shooter's death. Here's part of the president's remarks just a short time ago. Authorities are continuing to investigate the crime. And the assailant has now died from his injuries. The FBI is leading the investigation and will continue to provide updates as new information becomes available. The president would go on to say that we as Americans may have our differences, but he said that we all share one thing, which is a love for this country and sort of demonstrative of that resilience. You're seeing it from within this administration on this day as well. I'm told the gentleman by the name of Francis Brook, one of the coaches for the Republican congressional baseball team, was there at the field this morning. He's on the vice president, Mike Pence's policy staff. He was there as the incident took place. Fortunately, he was uninjured, quickly returned to work, and he's already back trying to conduct the business of the American people, his aides say today. Back to you. All right. Peter Alexander, who's been with us all morning from the White House as this unfolds. Um, and let's go back to Pete Williams, our justice correspondent, who also has been working his sources on the phone. Pete, anything more you can add to us? Well, uh, remarkably, uh, given how long ago this happened, uh, we still don't have a clear picture of how many people were shot and wounded here. Um, we know that the gunman has died. We know about Congressman Scalise. We know about a staffer for Congressman Roger Williams of Texas. We know about Matt Micah, who is the lobbyist for Tyson Foods for the last six years. Zach Barth, the name of the staffer. Uh, we're showing on the, our screen right now two Capitol Police officers are being wounded. But uh, all day, frankly, I've had been hearing conflicting figures on whether it's two or three Capitol Police officers who were wounded. So we're trying to uh, get a better read on that and what their conditions are. Um, and I'm, I'm sure this will all be uh, will all become clear right now. But with people taken to different hospitals, with different law enforcement organizations involved in this, different um, local uh, EMTs and fire departments responsible for transporting people who were who were shot, uh, I don't think there's a good 
clear 100 percent nailed down picture of how many people were wounded. And uh, what we do know is that these are the folks who were uh, transported to hospitals. What we still don't know is whether other people received minor wounds and were treated at the scenes or were walk-ins and or, or chose not to seek medical attention. Because the House Speaker Paul Ryan is now on the House floor. Let's listen. Almighty God, on a day when violence has come to this assembly, we ask your blessing on our brother, Representative Steve Scalise, the two officers and the staffer who have been shot. Bless the hands of those who tend to their injuries. We as Americans are blessed by a free and open society with rights secured by law and the Constitution. But once again, we are reminded that there is a vulnerability that comes with that openness. May we all be vigilant in being good citizens, neighbors, and defenders of our way of life at a time when so many challenges to our way of life and government seem under siege. We thank you for the men and women who respond to the crises that befall us, especially the Capitol Police and all first responders. May their heroism and generosity of spirit be an inspiration to us all, and may they be assured of our appreciation of their service. And in this great silence, as we are gathered most dramatically as this assembly, the People's House, may Republicans and Democrats be mindful of the rare companionship they share. Men and women who have taken very public responsibility for our country that carries so many burdens. And today the reminder, shared danger. May this day be characterized by kindness goodwill and compassion one to another. God bless America, and may all that is done this day be for your greater honor and glory. Amen. Amen. The chairs examine the journal of the last day's proceedings and announces to the House's approval thereof. Pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 1, the journal stands approved. The chair will lead the House in the Pledge of Allegiance and invites the members of the gallery to join. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For what purpose does the gentleman from Wisconsin seek recognition? I ask to revise and extend my remarks and address the House for one minute. The gentleman is recognized. My colleagues, there are very strong emotions throughout this House today. We are all horrified by this dreadful attack on our friends and on our colleagues and those who serve and protect this capital. We are all praying for those who are attacked and for their families. Steve Scalise, Zachary Barth, Matt Micah, Special Agent David Bailey, Special Agent Crystal Griner. We are all giving our thoughts to those currently being treated for their injuries at this moment. And we are united. We are united in our shock we are united in our anguish. An attack on one of us is an attack on all of us.
I know we want to give our thanks to the first responders and to the Alexandria Police Department who are on the scene in minutes. And I know this House wants to state unequivocally that we are, as ever, awed by the tremendous bravery of the Capitol Police. <laughs> I spoke with Special Agent Bailey and Special Agent Griner this morning. One was being treated and one was about to go into surgery. I expressed our profound gratitude to them. It is clear to me, based on various eyewitness accounts, that without these two heroes, Agent Bailey and Agent Griner, many lives would have been lost. I know that we all want to learn as much as we can about what happened. We just all received a briefing from the Sergeant of Arms. I have complete confidence in the investigation that's being conducted by the Capitol Police, the FBI, who are also working with local law enforcement. I know we want to extend our gratitude for the outpouring of support that we've received from throughout the Capitol and from throughout the country. And now, knowing Steve Scalise, as we all do, he is likely really frustrated that he's not going to be able to play in the baseball game. <laughs> I also know that Steve wants all of us to commend the bravery of those who came to the aid of the wounded. In the coming days, we will hear their stories, and we will have the chance to hold up their heroism. My colleagues, there are so many memories from this day that we will want to forget, and there are so many images that we will not want to see again. But there is one image in particular that this House should keep, and that is a photo I saw this morning of our Democratic colleagues gathered in prayer this morning after hearing the news. You know, every day we come here to test and to challenge each other. We feel so deeply about the things that we fight for and the things that we believe in. At times, our emotions can clearly get the best of us. We're all imperfect. But we do not shed our humanity when we enter this chamber. For all the noise and all the fury, we are one family. These were our brothers and sisters in the line of fire. These were our brothers and sisters who ran into danger and sa saved countless lives. So before this house returns to its business, let's just slow down and reflect to think about how we're all being tested right now, because we are being tested right now. I ask each of you to join me to resolve to come together, to lift each other up, and to show the country, to show the world that we are one house, the people's house, united in our humanity. It is that humanity which will win the day, and it always will. God bless. I yield. Speaker Paul Ryan addressing the House floor in emotional terms this morning, um, saying we stand united. This is the people's house. Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter at this moment in time. Everyone united in the hopes that uh, those who were hurt today will recover fully and in gratitude to the Capitol Hill police officers who acted so courageously and we've learned their identities now. An attack on one of us is an attack on the all of us. Here's House Minority Speaker. Leader Nancy Pelosi now. Let's listen in to her. I, I rise to join the distinguished speaker in paying tribute to the brave men and women of the Capitol Police Force and also in sadness for the assault that was made on our colleagues and members of the staff. To my colleagues, you're going to hear me say something you've never heard me say before. I identify myself with the remarks of the speaker. <laughs> They're beautiful remarks, Mr. Speaker. Thank you so much for the sentiments that they represent. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
Again, we are not one caucus or the other in this house today, but I, we speak for each other in saying uh, that uh, we send our thoughts and prayers to our colleague, Steve Scalise. Personally, we have our Italian-American connection, so as soon as I heard his name, I wa was filled with concern, as I would be for anyone here, but we have that special connection, so our hopes and prayers, and I, I said to the speaker, I'll be asking you every five minutes, how is Steve coming along? And also to Z for Zach Barth in Congressman Roger Williams' office, Matt Mika, who is, Micah, who was a former staffer, and of course, as the speaker acknowledged, Crystal Greiner and David Bailey. And acknowledging their sacrifice, and the for how fortunate we all were that they were on the scene because other lives would have probably been lost. I want us to remember that every single day, the Capitol Police protects all of us, takes risk for us. And while a day like this is a time when we can focus on it so sadly, it doesn't mean that other days aren't as, aren't as challenging. And I especially want to call attention uh, to Detective John Gibson and Officer Jacob Chestnut, who almost uh, 19 years ago, 1988 it was, in July, lost their lives protecting the Congress, the Capitol. And not just the members of Congress, the staff, the press, and our visitors, people who come to see this Capitol, this great edifice to democracy, known throughout the world. So they are protecting a great deal. And it is an attraction. And that makes it all the more risky. You may not know this, my colleagues, but every time I pray, which is very frequently, and certainly every Sunday, I pray for all of you. All of you together. In the earlier years, I used to pray for your happiness, uh, for the fact that we would, working together, heed the words of President Kennedy in the closing of his, his inaugural address when he, when he said, "May God's, God's work must truly be our own. How do we view what God's will is for us? How do we come together to give confidence to the American people that as our founders intended, we would have our disagreements and we would debate them and we would have confidence in our beliefs and humility to listen to others. But in more recent years, I have been praying not only for that, but for our safety. As I, above anyone in here, and I can say that quite clearly, have been probably the target of more, well, I'm the political target, and therefore the target of more threats than anyone, perhaps other than the President of the United States, Barack Obama. And so I prayed for Barack Obama, and now I continue to pray for him, and I pray for Donald Trump, uh, that his presidency will be successful, and that his family will be safe. Because it is about family. We are called for a purpose to this body. It's a great thing, and we know what it means to each of us to serve, and we recognize that in others. And we also recognize that you have your constituents, we have ours, and we respect you and your constituents who sent you here, all worthy of respect. But we do have our differences. And so I pray, my prayer is that we can resolve our differences in a way uh, that furthers the preamble to the Constitution, takes us closer uh, to e, plurib e pluribus unum. And today, again, it was, it's, a, it's a, again, it's in the family. It's an injury in the family uh, for the staff and for our colleague and for his leadership. As I mentioned just a minute ago in the Fuller thing, sports are a wonderful thing in our country. Probably one of the most unified, I think, the arts. We like the same music or plays or whatever. But sports really bring us together in our cities. You see people who have the biggest differences of opinion in politi on politics, and yet when their team is on the field, people come together. People come together. So when this team was on the field practicing uh, in such a 
with such camaraderie and such brotherhood. I don't know if you have any sisters on your team. We have two on our team. For, for, for this person to take this action was so cowardly, so cowardly. We all learn more about motivation and the rest of that. But it seems particularly sad, although any violent death, of course, is sad, but particularly sad that at a time when we, people want us to come together and we're prepared to come together tomorrow night, that this assault would be made. But we cannot let that be a victory for the assailant or anyone who would think that way. So tomorrow we'll go out on the field, we'll root for our team, we we'll want everyone to do his or her very best, and we will use this occasion as one that brings us together and not separates us further. And with that, again, I want to thank the speaker for bringing us together, and again, with endless gratitude to our Capitol Police, in particular today, of course, Crystal Griner, David Bailey, but never out of our prayers, Detective John Gibson and Officer Jacob Chestnut. Thank you, my colleagues, for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you on this sad day. Steve and others, you are deeply in our prayers. We count the minutes until you return. Please convey that to him, Mr. Speaker. Thank you all. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi there uh, also striking a chord of unity uh, on the heels of House Speaker Paul Ryan's comments uh, there in the lower chamber. Shame, this is an incident the in the family, the family of uh, members of Congress. We want to bring in one of those family members, Arizona Senator Jeff Flake, who was there this morning taking part in this baseball practice. He joins us from the Capitol. Senator, good morning right. to you. We're glad to see you safe and sound. And um, what an experience you've been through. Tell us, tell us your experience. Tell us what happened. Well, we were, it was about uh, 10 after 7 uh, when we heard the first shot. Uh, we were almost all on the field, either batting or, or fielding. And uh, we uh, f heard the first shot, wasn't sure what it was, but there was a quick volley after that. And obviously we knew that there was a gunman. We just didn't know exactly where he was. So it was a really pandemonium. He was kind of by the third base dugout, so very close, just within 10, 15 feet of the closest members or staff and uh, he was firing uh, on everybody. So a number of us uh, took refuge in the dugout, the first base dugout, and, and uh, for the next 10 minutes, uh, there were shots fired back and forth uh, continuously. Uh, so it was, a, it was a harrowing time. Senator, were you able to, to, to discern whether the gunman was, was saying anything, screaming anything? You know, some have, have said that there was screaming going on, but to tell you the truth, in the pandemonium that, that we were experiencing with the gunshots, and we were treating one of the staffers who had been hit, who had made his way to the dugout, and then trying to figure out when we could get out to Steve, who was in the field, just laying there uh, motionless. Um, that was the, 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 the toughest part. So I, I don't know what was screamed. I, I couldn't tell where it was coming from. Senator, did you make your way over to Congressman Scalise? Were you able to interact with him? Can, was he able yes. to speak? How, how yes. was he? He was. He was able to speak. He was awake, uh, conscious. He, uh, I mean, really, through great effort, uh, dragged himself after being shot uh, off the infield and into the outfield to be a little further away uh, from the gunman. And so, yeah, but I just kept trying to talk to him, keep him talking. He wanted some water. Um, he was uh, awake, but it, the, the uh, wound that he had was bleeding uh, quite a bit. And so a few others uh, came out, um, including a doctor who's a member of the House, Brad, from uh, Ohio. And uh, we helped put pressure just to keep the, the blood from coming. Senator, I understand that, uh, that you call uh, Congressman Scalise's wife. Uh, what did you say to her? What did she say to you? Yes, one of the staff members got Steve's phone right after he uh, was being taken away in the ambulance. And uh, so I called her. I didn't want her to, to hear it on the news and not know uh, that he, it looked like he was going to be okay. And uh, so I just said that there, I said who I was and uh, that I was at the practice and um, that uh, there was a shooting, that uh, Steve was okay, um, but he had been shot. And uh, so. Anyway, I, I quickly called my wife as well, and uh, 
you never want people to see this on the news, not knowing uh, what the condition of their loved one is. So uh, I was glad I was able to talk to her before she had seen the news. And Senator, forgive the, the question, but how are you feeling? How are you doing? I mean, what you a know, thing to, to go through. It's, it's nothing I ever want to go through again, obviously. It was, uh, it was just a horrible, horrible situation. Um, uh, having people down that you know you can't get to um, or help um, and not knowing uh, you know whether or not the gunman was going to make it uh, over into the dugout with us uh, that was that was really tough as well having a child there as well a 10 year old who we were trying to protect um, it just uh, it was a, a terrible situation but uh, I can tell you the Capitol Police were just all so grateful uh, had they not been there had they not returned fire um, and, and taking him down, you know, the, the death count would probably be very high. Senator, we heard from, from President Trump, we heard from uh, Speaker Ryan, and, and just heard from uh, Ms. Pelosi as well, all of them uh, saying that this should be used as an opportunity to perhaps tamp down the rhetoric in this country, uh, to change the, the political discourse to a certain extent, to, re to return to civility. What say you to that, Senator Flake? Is, is this um, an opportunity? Should this be an opportunity to do that? I, I sure hope so. And I was just really uh, pleased with the remarks of the president uh, and uh, Paul Ryan and Nancy Pelosi. It's all been a call of unity. I think that the, everyone shares that. I got a call this morning from President Obama, uh, who had watched the news and knew that I was there and, and called. Uh, Paul Ryan, uh, Mike Pence called while I was still at the field. Uh, there, I mean, people are concerned, and uh, it just made me recall, obviously, uh, the Gabby Gifford shooting um, and uh, the horrible situation in Tucson, the horrible scene that that was. I also talked to Gabby's husband, Mark, this morning. Uh, uh, Gabby had watched the news, and uh, obviously had to be very difficult for her to watch as well. But uh, I hope that we become more unified. It's, it's horrible that it uh, takes something like this, but I hope that's the case. We have some images of the shooter, some new images that um, are just coming into our newsroom as we speak to you, Senator. Is there any doubt in your mind that this was an individual who was targeting members of Congress? I, I don't know how anybody could draw another conclusion. Uh, there was some, uh, somebody saying that he had asked somebody standing around there if this was a, a Democrats or Republican practice. and so. Yeah, it seemed he was certainly targeting, uh, whether he was targeting individual members or staff members, we don't know, but he certainly seemed to know what he was doing. All right, uh, Senator Flake, uh, and again, the, the game is going to go on tomorrow yeah. at Nationals Field, as I understand it. Do you perhaps want to give us a score prediction? <laughs> no, not at all. I, I think everybody will be glad that it's being played and yeah. uh, we can rally together. You know, it's uh, Republicans against Democrats, but it's always... Uh, it's always done for charity. I think we've already raised about $650,000 this year uh, through this game for disadvantaged kids in the district. And it's, it's a great event. It's one of uh, Capitol Hill's best traditions. Well, I hope it's a, you know, all the more unifying right. in light of this. Senator Flake, it's so good to have you with us and be able to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you. Meanwhile, the sheriff from James Hodgkinson's hometown of Belleville, Illinois, uh, just held a news conference a few moments ago. He talked about a recent incident involving Mr. Hodgkinson there. Our justice correspondent. Oh, actually, let's listen to that. You know, in these rural areas now, they're building houses everywhere, and people were concerned about him shooting. Even though it is legal to shoot on his property, we don't want anybody getting hurt. So we went over there and talked to him, explained to him, hey, the rifle you're shooting, you know, could actually ricochet off something, go toward this house. And he said the house is a couple hundred yards from him. But, you know, some of these guns that you shoot, you know, a bullet can travel up to a mile. So, you know, for safety reasons, we went over and, and talked to him. He was very nice, said, hey, I'll take it to a range somewhere that's safer. And, and that was the end of it. And that was the sheriff from uh, the suspect's hometown in Illinois. It sound, came to it a little bit late, but it sounds like he was describing an encounter with the suspect 
over some shooting exercises he was doing at his house and that they had an abundance of caution said yeah. maybe take it somewhere else and the, uh, the sheriff saying that he was cooperative with that we're just beginning to get to put the pieces together about who this individual was this is a uh, a man who was apparently known to law enforcement also uh, as Pete Williams indicated earlier uh, was a a prolific writer of letters to the local newspaper again this is a an image that we just got in a short time ago of the gunman who again uh, President Trump informing the country a short time ago that the gunman is dead he was uh, taken out either during that shootout or shortly thereafter uh, Justice correspondent Pete Williams standing by for us uh, as well Pete at this point what else do we know uh, about the gunman what else do we know about the, the five victims so we can tell you a little more about what Sheriff Rick Watkinson, uh, Watson was just talking about. This is from March 24th. According to records of uh, uh, Sheriff's Office records that were filed at the time, uh, there was a complaint from a neighbor who heard gunshots being fired, called the Sheriff's Office. They went out and talked to Hodgkinson and said uh, he should not fire his weapon in an area that there were homes nearby. He said he was shooting in an area that had some pine trees. You heard the sheriff say he had a rifle. Uh, what we're told by law enforcement is that he had an assault rifle and a handgun with him. When he came to the baseball practice area this morning, just outside Washington, D.C., and began firing with the rifle, witnesses say he also had additional ammunition in, in, in magazines or clips and that he paused during the shooting spree to reload uh, at least once or perhaps twice so that he had additional ammunition with him. Uh, we don't know when these weapons were purchased or where that's what we're trying to find out but if indeed it was a rifle and that he fired what the witnesses said at the time were something like 50 shots that would suggest that at least as of um, two and a half months ago march 24th he had this rifle but why he had it whether he was at the time contemplating like this when he decided to do this and why we still don't know and i think it's going to take a while to figure that out and also pete i mean we don't know where he was living at the time because of course his hometown and his driver's license is from illinois but then julie carey who is the local reporter yeah. who covers virginia for our affiliate in washington said that her sources were saying he was a member of the ymca right, right there just recently gave up his membership but that he was an individual recognized by the folks who worked at that YMCA. And apparently the neighbors in Illinois say he, he had not lived in the house uh, that's on his driver's license uh, for, uh, they didn't say how long, but we know he was there at least in late March, uh, March 24th, where he was firing that weapon. Now, whether he went back there and was just there for a short time or not, but neighbors had said he had been out of his own house for a while. Pete, uh, we also heard from House Speaker Paul Ryan there. He gave us the two names of the Capitol Hill police officers uh, who were shot, David Bailey and Crystal Griner. Uh, one was being treated. The other was going into surgery. Uh, Zach Barth, Matt Micah, and, and of course, Congressman uh, Scalise. Uh, those are the five known wounded at this point. Uh, what do we know about their conditions? Uh, or I know there's been some confusion throughout the morning about just the, perhaps the number of people who'd been shot and wounded. Well, in terms of the Capitol Police officers, uh, their wounds are described as non-life-threatening. And uh, one federal official told me earlier today they'll be okay. Well, I'm not sure exactly what okay means, but they're, but they're non-life-threatening injuries. Uh, you've heard the description of Congressman Scalise was shot in the hip and was conscious, calling his wife afterwards. So it sounds like it's a non-life-threatening wound to him. Um, we don't know much about the wound to the other congressional aide or to uh, Matt Micah, who was the lobbyist for Tyson Foods. Uh, his company had said earlier that they were uh, deeply concerned about his injuries, and witnesses had said they thought he was shot in the chest. And what you may be alluding to is those are the people we know who were taken to the hospital. We still don't know whether other people received minor wounds and either de uh, declined medical treatment or walked in to get treatment on their own. We know of these folks who were among the more seriously hurt. Yeah. Uh, we actually just this morning, Pete, as we saw members of Congress who were coming over to the Capitol, some of them had scratches yeah. and bruises. Some of them said, I don't even know where I got this, just mm. in the, all of the melee and, and running and diving into the dugout trying to avoid the the exchange of gunfire. Pete, stand by there. I want to go back to Capitol Hill. Senator Bernie Sanders, who of course um, has learned this morning that the suspect apparently volunteered for his campaign, made a statement on the Senate floor. Uh, let's play a portion of that.
I have just been informed that the alleged shooter at the Republican baseball practice this morning is someone who apparently volunteered on my presidential campaign. I am sickened by this despicable act, and let me be as clear as I can be. Violence of any kind is unacceptable in our society, and I condemn this action in the strongest possible terms. Senator Bernie Sanders on the Senate floor just a few moments ago reacting to this unfolding event. Uh, so again, <clears throat> as we've been talking about, this picture that continues to emerge of the of the suspected gunman, the now a dead suspected gunman. We know that he was a, a volunteer. Uh, we know that he had this Illinois driver's license, but apparently had been living uh, by and large here in, in, in northern Virginia. Uh, he's also, and we just got this picture in a short time ago. This is, uh, according to our justice correspondent Peter Williams, uh, also known uh, as a bit of a, a protester. He was a prolific writer as well uh, to local newspapers. The Belleville News Democrat, uh, the, perhaps the paper of record there in, in Bellevue. Um, at one point, uh, one of the letters he wrote, he said in part, or wrote in part, quote, I have never said life sucks, only the policies of Republicans. Um, wrote a number of letter, letters uh, to the editor, editors uh, of the paper there, often railing against Republicans and tax policies, uh, and at least once uh, advocating uh, for legalizing uh, marijuana as well. And we're just starting to put the pieces together as law enforcement is, of course, we're starting to get some of these images of the shooter and recall that Congressman DeSantis live on our air said that he believed that he had had an exchange this morning right. with the shooter moments before he went on to the baseball field. Congressman DeSantis was on his way out. He says that the shooter asked him, is it Republicans or is it Democrats over there practicing on the field? And of course, we know what happened next. Um, I want to go to Tom Costello. Standing by for us there still in Alexandria. Um, Tom, what do you have? It's it's I, let me just tell you, it's a brutally hot day here uh, with the, you know, incredible humidity, as you would expect in Washington, D.C. So pardon the sunglasses. Let me just a couple of points. Let me show you. There's a church right here on the street corner uh, and they it's an Anglican church and they uh, held a special mass today at noon. You may see the signs there uh, in the yard, a special noon mass and also Bible study at 1030 uh, following this shooting. We're literally a block or so away. In fact, for for perspective, you go down the street and it's literally on the left by about a block block and a half or so that's where the ball field is on the other side of the ball field you have soccer fields uh, and when I was driving in uh, there were people out on the soccer fields and then the fire and EMS personnel and police personnel all swarming this area it was uh, just gridlock with emergency vehicles and obviously they've all pulled back now you just have investigators on the scene this is an FBI investigation as you've been hearing you have the lead from the FBI in Washington but then assist from Alexandria police on the scene, also Capitol Hill police. They were involved, of course, in the shooting with the suspect and also alcohol, tobacco and firearms officers are on the scene. So very much multi-jurisdictional as, as you expect in Washington, D.C. Um, one other point, you're talking about the suspect and ha he had been seen and known in Northern Virginia. Our local affiliate here on Washington, uh, NBC Washington News 4, is reporting that the suspect had actually been spending some time time in the YMCA and the YMCA is adjacent to the ballpark just right down the street. In fact, some of those YMCA's uh, windows were were uh, shot out during the exchange of gunfire. Uh, amazingly, nobody in the Y was injured, although this is the time of day when people are exercising and on the treadmill and the ellipticals or whatever. Uh, the, the glass was shot out, but uh, nobody inside was hurt. But the suspect apparently had spent some time, according to our, our colleague at Channel 4 in Washington had spent some time there at the Y. And, and whether he was uh, canvassing the, the, uh, the, the ballparks or whatever, had talked about the activity on the ballparks, talked to people about who was coming and going, whether it was members of Congress, that kind of thing, and at, a, at one point or more had a laptop with him. Whether he was surfing the web or taking notes, we simply don't know. But that information is coming from uh, local Alexandria government officials. Uh, so it is, as you would expect, 
expect a very much an active scene with the investigation very much uh, centered on what's happening and this community now trying to rebound from this uh, really horrific act of violence in the neighborhood. You know, one, one last point. There was some uh, communication you heard during the news conference about, and I asked, I asked the FBI agent whether this was an attempted assassination. Uh, and he didn't want to go there. But obviously, if you're aiming at a member of Congress uh, and trying to kill a member of Congress, then that becomes attempted assassination of a government official. So uh, this is uh, all the more reason to underscore how serious of an event this is. That goes to the very heart of the democracy. Back to you. Absolutely. And as Julie Carey, the, the reporter, mentioned, that, that it was well known that this is where members of Congress right. have been practicing for softball. Tom, yeah. thank you so much. We're joined now by California Congressman Adam Schiff. Congressman, good morning. I know you were not there morning. this morning, but I, I can only imagine as a member of the House, um, as, as Speaker Pelosi, former Speaker Pelosi said, it's an attack in the family. Uh, it really is. Uh, you know, you think with a membership of 535 in both houses that it's a big place, but on a day like today, you realize just what a small family we are. Uh, we all know each other. Our family members know each other. Uh, and we feel very much today that an attack on any one of us is an attack on all of us. Uh, this brings back the most uh, harrowing memories of when Gabby Giffords was shot and we wondered whether she would survive. Uh, thank God uh, our colleague and the police officers and others um, look like they have come through this. Uh, and we are so grateful to the Capitol Police. Uh, they risk their lives for us uh, all the time and, uh, and we're so much in their debt today. Congressman, um, we've heard from a number of folks this morning who are at the field who have said, had it not been for Congressman Scalise's uh, security detail, uh, this is a situation that would have been far, far worse. One lawmaker uh, even going so far as to say it likely would have been a massacre. Are, are our lawmakers sufficiently protected? Do you guys feel as if you're safe enough there in Washington, D.C., and back in your home districts as well? Well, we had this debate uh, during an all-hands meeting today, and uh, it was very reminiscent of the same discussion we had after Gabby Giffords was shot. Uh, none of us want to insulate ourselves from our constituents. We all want to continue doing our town halls and our sidewalk office hours. Uh, but I do think that there are probably some common sense uh, security improvements that we're going to need to make. One of them here, and you're absolutely right, uh, it was the fortuity that one of the leadership, Steve Scalise himself, was on the field. Otherwise, there would have been no security there at all. And indeed, at the Democratic uh, baseball practice this morning, uh, there was no security there. Uh, so we were really fortunate to have Capitol Police on hand. It probably doesn't make sense uh, when there are large members uh, of Congress gathering for, that, uh, for something like that to only have security depending on which members are there. So that's something I'm sure that we'll revisit. Uh, but as a practical matter, I don't think we're going to be able to change uh, probably our most vulnerable points, and that is uh, where we are out in our districts. And you never know, Congressman, uh, what's in anyone's heart. But uh, you know, in terms of this having a political motivation, which all signs this morning from witness testimony to um, what we know about the background of the shooter, it certainly seems that way. I mean, does this seem like a wake-up call to kind of, for all, all those involved in Washington, to kind of lower the temperature on the political rhetoric? Uh, I think it does. Uh, I think it's a, a wake-up call, not only for all of us here in the Capitol, but people around the country, uh, that we need to somehow get back to a much more civil discourse uh, about our policy disagreements. Uh, in the meeting we had among members today, it was quite apparent that there's been a, an increase, maybe even a dramatic increase, in death threats uh, facing all members, and uh, all of us have received them, Democrats and Republicans alike. Uh, and it's hard to imagine that uh, this uh, increase is not due in part to the incredible coarsening uh, of the political debate. Well, Congressman Schiff, we're glad to have you with us this morning, sir. Thank you very much, and please send our best to your colleagues. Will do. Thank you. Senator Claire McCaskill uh, of Missouri is standing by for us as well. Uh, Senator McCaskill, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Uh, let's, let's start with where we just left off with Congressman Schiff, this serving as a wake-up call uh, to lawmakers in, in both chambers. Should this serve as that, and where do we go from here? Well, the only positive thing that could come out of this would be a moment in time where we all 
you know, take a deep breath and begin to talk um, more kindly towards one another. Uh, we can disagree, but it has gotten so partisan. It's gotten so divisive around here and in the country. Um, we, we, this is not the first time a member of Congress has been shot, but it, it would be terrific if it was the last time and we could set the example uh, to, to make a stand against hate by um, quit trying to demonize the other side, quit trying to make them uh, something that is something different than just a disagreement over public policy. So I'm hopeful that that might be uh, a glimmer of sunshine um, from a very, very dark cloud that has descended over the Capitol today. Senator, as you mentioned, this isn't the first time that a member of Congress has been shot. Have you ever been concerned as you go about your business, campaigning, doing town halls, about your own safety? Is it cross your mind now? Well, I'm a former prosecutor, and so I spent many years putting um, the worst kind of violent criminals in prison. And so those days, probably, I was looking over my shoulder more than since I've been in the Senate. There have been some, I do a lot of town halls. Uh, there have been some raucous town halls um, over my career. I'm from a very, uh, we don't all agree in Missouri, so it's not unusual for people to have a lot of passion uh, at town halls. Uh, but I gotta tell you, I really like the fact that I don't travel with an entourage. I like that I drive to the grocery store myself and talk to people in the produce department. Uh, I like it that people feel like they can come up to me and say, hey, Claire, at the airport, without um, having some kind of circle of security around me that makes it really impossible for me to have those really genuine interactions that I think are so important for me staying grounded on what I need to be doing. So I hope we don't go too far. I think we can take some steps here, but I hope we don't go too far. Missouri Senator uh, Claire McCaskill. Senator McCaskill, our, our thoughts and prayers with, with you and your colleagues there in Washington today. Thank you. Let us check back in with NBC's justice correspondent Pete Williams, who's indispensable as always uh, on a day like this, and, and just see if you've been able to gather any more, have any more thoughts as we uh, wrap up our coverage here. Well, I think uh, I'll just summary say that they're trying to figure out now his movements. It seems pretty clear that he left his home in Illinois after uh, uh, firing his weapon into the woods in late March and came here the uh, last couple of weeks and has been staying in this area. But why he came here is a huge question that is going to take a while to answer. Uh, did he come here with the shooting in mind? Uh, did he come here for, because of some vague intent that later formed into this shooting? That's an unresolved question that authorities are very eager to answer right now. And it's going to involve what you're looking at right now, searching his home in Illinois, talking to the people he was in touch with here, tracing his movements, looking at his social media. Uh, unfortunately, you know, you just heard from Claire McCaskill. Unfortunately, members of Congress have been targets in the past. People have shot at members of Congress in the United States Capitol more than once. They have shot at them at local events like Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, now at this baseball practice. So we've unfortunately had some experience here. But why, what led to this and why were others involved? Still a mystery at this point. Obviously, it's of great investigative interest. Pete, we'll check back in with you on Nightly. Thank you. Meanwhile, Tom Costello is uh, at, the, at the shooting scene just down the street from that park. Tom, we've got uh, just a few minutes here. Bring us up to speed on where we are there. So full investigation, as Pete was mentioning, with not only, of course, local authorities, but federal authorities. The FBI has the lead on this, as Pete was mentioning. A uh, tremendous sense of appreciation uh, and relief that Capitol Hill police officers were on the ground and immediately engaged the suspect and took him out uh, because a man with an AK-47 type of weapon taking aim at members of Congress uh, and their families uh, nearby, the, you could imagine we could have been dealing Dealing with an absolutely horrific situation here uh, in Alexandria, Virginia. If not for the fast acting Capitol Hill police officers who are part of that security detail, and then Alexandria police and fire and EMS who rushed in, uh, they clearly prevented a tragedy here. So we're all in this community grateful for that. And you hear that yeah. repeatedly from people who were on the scene and also the neighbors. Uh, as yeah. for where this investigation goes, it's now firmly in the hands of the FBI. Absolutely. About six 
hours ago was when this all started. Five people shot when a gunman walked into a baseball practice with congressional aides and members of Congress and opened fire. And we, of course, will continue to follow this throughout the day on MSNBC, NBCNews.com, and tonight on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. For now, though, for Craig Melvin, I'm Savannah Guthrie here in New York. We're going to return you to your regularly scheduled programming. Good day.